get an idea why AI is so important. This is like the mid 90s. And if you compare that to the mid 90s, it was very hard for people to get an idea of the power of the internet that it is today. Adrian, he's a founder of Merantix, an AI company experimenting in different fields of AI, fintech AI, engineering data, digital health, automotive, advertising, advertising, to explain how AI works in a way that you understand why it's so important. What is the difference between the old way yeah. and the new way? I like to I like to use a, an image. Big differences between um, you know computing and machine learning. Take uh, Gary Kasparov and Deep Blue. Deep Blue um, has beaten Gary in 1997. The afternoon of May 11th, 1997, Game Six, the deciding game. Deep Blue challenges Kasparov's brain with an array of 256 processors that can examine 200 million possible moves every second. They call it the brute force approach. A hardcore brute force computational challenge and it was drilling down all the probabilities that you can imagine and at the end it came up with the solution. Dumb computing. Yeah. By that time, of course, it was pretty amazing. 20 years later, last year, um, DeepMind AlphaGo. That's the Google AI research exactly. company. Exactly. They built an engine that was able to play um, Go, the Asian strategy game Go. In chess, the number of possible moves is about 20 for the average position. In Go, it's about 200. Another way of viewing the complexity of Go is that the number of possible configurations of the board is more than the number of atoms in the universe. It's just incredibly big, okay. and it's so big that no supercomputer, no cluster of all supercomputers on the world can actually do brute force calculation. It's just impossible. If you ask a great Go player why they played a particular move, sometimes they'll just tell you it felt right. So you can, the one way you can think of it is that Go is a much more intuitive game, uh, whereas chess is a much more logic-based game. What DeepMind with AlphaGo did was basically they come up with a machine that started to develop intelligence um, that was looking at a couple of hundred thousand games of Go and was learning strategies. And he was analyzing human, human beings playing this game. And one of the major reasons why uh, AlphaGo actually won 4 to one against Lee Sedol was playing this game, the machine learned how the, 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 the human player was playing this game and it developed a new strategy how it could beat this thing. And that's what is intelligence all about. If you're critics of AI, you would still say, yeah, but it's still like you need to program it. There is an algorithm just repeating and repeating. How is the machine applying the new strategy and how is the learning taking place? So exactly. So um, there was no programming of an algorithm in that case. The machine was watching, literally was watching games and it was learning from these games. So if you want, it was a lot of unsupervised learning that was not somebody sitting there programming some routines that would then be followed. But it was a machine looking at these games, learning. And it was basically, if you want, it was programming its own algorithms, but it was also constantly developing them. So there is no point in time where the algorithm is finished. That's also like mm. the comparison we can do to the human brain. The human brain is mostly based on trial and error learning. That's, um, and that's also the, the, I think the big paradigm shift that has happened between the 90s and today. In the 90s, the idea was, yeah, we have to program this intelligent computer. We have to program it. And later on, uh, science learned and, and, and discovered, hey, what about if we take the human being as a example? 
So if you look at a, at a small child, um, when it's born, it starts to learn by interacting with his environment. Yeah. And every step that it does that works is stored um, and then the next steps will be based on what was stored before. So it's, it's kind of a, a, an evolutionary process and, and that's what, um, what deep learning is all about. In terms of future of work and uh, also the, the actual challenges of digital transformation that many companies face, they are already quite packed with a lot of internal staff and organization. What would you say, like, what do you need in a company to stay ahead of that development in terms of AI? Is there a best practice, a worst practice? Well, I would, I would um, be tempted to say forget about technology. It's all about culture. Culture is what defines um, being successful or not. You're part of this development that happens and um, swimming uh, inside um, actually uh, makes you a bit blind for the magnitude of change that is actually going on. And we had this discussion yesterday when somebody was, was um, in, in the round uh, mentioning, oh, you know, like today, nobody can imagine uh, the life without a smartphone. Yeah. And it's 10 years ago that the smartphone was released. And so I, th I think that's, that's this amazing kind of thinking that you need to uh, apply when you're thinking about these kind of technologies. Um, it's very hard to imagine something that is not here yet. That's why it's so hard to imagine how exponential technologies are going to develop. I like this, I like this, um, this statement that uh, Bill Gates did uh, when he said, um, people are usually overestimating um, the impact of technology uh, in the short term. So they're overestimating what will happen in the next three years. But they are also usually underestimating what then happens in 10 years because they just cannot imagine. And Adrian gave the recommendation I should ask Rasmus, who is the master in their topic, how is this learning working? Well, so for the learning, basically, you just show a lot of data to the network and without saying, you know, these are the important things to look in for in the data, it actually look, uh, finds out itself what, what to look for and really learns also really complex patterns. So in the past, if you would want to recognize a car in an image, you would tell them, okay, look for the wheels, look for the front shield, look for these parts, this is roughly the shape. And these days you don't say anything, you just say, hey, here's an image, figure out what you need to know to recognize a car. And that's really the difference, and that really allows you to learn really complex patterns. If we, if we compare these algorithms with a machine, though, and we have the old machine, yeah. and you then have the, the new machine, how much more complex is it to code something that detects a car in the image by itself? So the hard part is not just the coding, but it's also the design of the neural network. So okay. you need to design the neural network and how it's connected and what kind of data to feed in and then you need to optimize the whole thing. It needs a lot of computational resources because it has you know, hundreds of millions of parameters. So you're talking about very high performance computing and uh, that's, that's also a very big challenge of the whole thing. But how do you do it? Like you, you, you coded that by yourself, right? Exactly, you, you code it by yourself, you build the network, the architecture by yourself and then you start optimizing it and so that it starts learning the right yeah. concepts. You have little computational units which can do very simple things like mm -hmm. multiplication and addition and they're, they're kind of stupid, but if you connect thousands and millions of them and you know, bring them together in a network, then you can learn really complex relationships. And what you basically do is, you connect all these neurons and then you show it data. And in the beginning, then all the connections are random. Some are stronger, some are weaker, but they're super random. They, the network doesn't know anything. And once you start showing data to the network, you start optimizing those weights such that the network really predicts right. the right thing. So if you, on the input, put an image from a person and you want to predict the age of a person, then in the beginning, the network will com uh, predict complete garbage. Yeah. But over time, as you show more data, the network will know how to optimize the parameters so that it will predict the right number at the output. So let's assume, I mean, you run an AI company, you're a scientist, you know what you're looking for. But let's assume you're on the other side. I'm meeting CEOs and CDOs and say like, how can I say if that is bullshit what these guys are doing or not? They get an offer, 
and I want to tell is that good or bad. But I think first thing is like when you when you use neural networks, they're not the perfect tool for any kind of data. Mm. If you have a very simple problem and you can express it in a couple of rules how to make a decision, you don't need to use neural networks. It's too complex. But it, once you start having hundreds of thousands of images and you know like mm. text data and very complex data, then the neural networks is the right tool. And so when evaluating teams on base of that, I mean it's very it's because it's a very academic topic. It's yeah. kind of good to kind of look at their background, see if they've been in research, have, have been doing neural networks in the past. Which of the big companies are currently ahead or leading that field? I, I would say like Google DeepMind is very strong in terms of academic research. Also mm -hmm. Google Research is good. Um, then you have Facebook AI research is also very strong. I would definitely say they are kind of the leading companies. But then again, Amazon is also very good. Um, Apple starts to publish more and more on what they're doing. They have some very good people. So I would say they are all very good. They all have slightly different focus. Um, and so that, that kind of makes a difference. What's the recommendation you would give a typical mid-size or even like a, a big company in Europe to like keep an eye on that field or do something? What is a good next step? I think one thing is to really stay up to date is to really go to these like academic research conferences. They have changed a lot. Mm -hmm. Even five years ago, you know, there were only academics and now all the big companies send their people there. So right. I think that's a good starting point to see what's going on, not just on the research side, but also on the on the application side. And I mean, secondly, you, you should look into your own company and really figure out where do I have interesting data, mm. where can I collect interesting data, uh, where can, can I use external data which is already out there, or what, mm. what data can I buy, and then think about what kind of business cases can, you can approach for that. Perfect. And now we do something that AI won't solve for us yet. We will have a beer. Thanks.